mismo Lucas Andrés. I'm gonna, I'm gonna create because then I have to get it all out. We are presenting together. So but I assume everybody hears me. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> we just pretend yeah. the highlight. Okay, hi everybody. Uh and I figures. Yes, no, I figure. Thank you. Very good. Good afternoon. Um I'm gonna ask uh, start with a cash. Uh, you we have been presented to Ampiroshka, she's Olga, and actually this has been a Theme work of for female economists that it happens over the internet really in the last I don't know year or so. Um, and I'm going to ask actually a question from you, the audience, in my professorial uh, you know manner. How many of you have uh, listened to the opening panel this morning? Okay. Okay, not bad, not bad, because what you heard there from Guillermo Ortiz, the former uh, governor of the, the Central Bank of, of Mexico, and uh, currently, and uh, you know, he has worked at uh, various uh, you know, high level positions, currently member of the G, uh, G30 group, basically stole our standard. Uh, <laughs> he said, if you recall, that emerging markets had reacted much earlier to the inflationary pressures in the post-COVID period, roughly a year earlier than advanced country uh, central banks. And this is really what, in the end, uh, got us this idea, this you know, um, uh, development and phenomenon, emerging market central bank behavior in the post-COVID world in comparison with the Fed and the ECB, we uh, just maybe pick uh, powerful comparators, is something that we wanted to investigate. And through the prism of uh, central bank communication. So um, that's our story. So we compare 22 emerging markets, including uh, uh, Mexico, uh, central bank uh, policy actions uh, through communication and uh, policy communication uh, using um, novel methods, but really drawing a lot on, on what has been done at the BIS and, and the IMF uh, by eminent researchers, uh, comparing communication data. So under the banner, if you, you know this uh, sort of uh, text as data. As a precursor, I want to say that it is not about assessing improving the prediction of policy actions. So if you came for that, this is not about that. Again, it's comparing policy behavior so the, measured the, so the communication and in its effectiveness. And uh, our key message, uh, uh, as I said uh, from, uh, from uh, PM Ortiz, that emerging markets actually have caught up, both in terms of uh, framework and in, uh, in, in communication, in the run up to the COVID crisis, and they benefited during the COVID crisis from that improvement and from, from several other factors, um, and outperformed uh, the ECB and, and the Fed. Yet, of course, there is, uh, you always say, in the Polish circles, there is still room for improvement. But that's the main finding, and uh, this is what uh, also Guillermo told us in the morning. This is the story, the context, which I'm not going to spend too much time, even though you know, we have so much time apparently in the panel. Uh, not going to spend too much time on. There's no point there. But this is exactly what, what uh, Guillermo described to us. So we ourselves uh, start from the early 2000s, depending on the data availability from emerging markets. And become, we, we really measure until, you know, First quarter of 2023, so very, very up to date. Uh, Guillermo spoke about this spike and the fact that inflation, which is all about inflation, uh, uh, we, the emerging markets is the red line, the, the dotted excluding Turkey and Ukraine as outliers um, uh, on, on inflation and fat inflation and uh, many other central bank policies. 
So that's the dotted line. Um, and then the US, there's the, the uh, solid black line and the ECD, uh, Euro area inflation um, is the uh, shaded gray line. So his story in the, in the morning, uh, Guillermo's was that inflation was really shooting up everywhere. It was a global phenomenon uh, to some extent. Um, as you know, and we are not going into, into, into describing that, but it was a very similar, um, uh, you know, uh, increase. Yet, uh, policy rates, policy rate adjustment in emerging markets, again, the red line, uh, to happen earlier, uh, more than a year earlier, when, as he said, the uh, central bank uh, of, um, of, of Brazil increased policy rates. Uh, back in March 2021, whereas the Fed uh, and the ECB only a year or so later. It doesn't show that much because the time frame is, 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 is squashed a little bit, but it's a, a significant uh, sort of um, uh, earlier action um, to, uh, to the... Uh, so there was no discussion about, you know, inflation is temporary or not. There was not too much uh, discussion about whether to... Um, address inflationary pressures because uh, it is only a, a supply side shock to which you know first round effects with central banks are not supposed to, to react. Uh, emerging markets reacted on the onset of the um, price surges. So, in this respect, and that's what we claim a little bit provocatively, uh, admittedly, in the title that emerging markets have overtaken the masters. So of course, we look again uh, historically, and of course, inflation traditionally, uh, this is the spike of the global financial crisis, um, but historically was higher, but in the end, not very different uh, pre-COVID than uh, obviously a higher, and respect the higher policy rate uh, in emerging market. But again, the behavior uh, to the um, post-COVID inflation or COVID inflationary pressures was different. Was the methodology, we look at at the various uh, um, dimensions, some of it is is, uh, is is very well known. Central bank transparency, um, uh, independence, um, statement readability. Uh, Olga will be speaking more about sort of our database. Um, then sentiment analysis and topic decomposition. This is more sort of the the core of of, of the paper. Say see act analysis. So whether the central bank see uh, with the inflation uh, pressures, it communicates that it sees the inflationary pressures and they act and, and, and it acts in the end. So that is we call it CSA act analysis. And we look at various very specific uh, topics. Uh, some of it um, relates to um, emerging markets, especially exchange rate. Uh, as such, because of the high level of uh, financial dollarization still in several um, emerging markets and associated uh, balance sheet risk uh, from, from the exchange of volatility um, and, and other factors, supply side factors and others. So there's the methodology. Um, Central bank transparency independence, uh, we are using uh, here the um, uh, the this uh, uh, um, uh, methodology, which is reasonably you know well established, um, it it measures uh, um, pro, uh, uh, measures transparency. Uh, they also call it independence, but basic transparency across five dimensions: operational transparency, um, um, policy transparency, itself, procedural transparency, um, uh, economic transparency, and political. Uh, transparency. Honestly, I don't think they remember why uh, political what it meant. Probably this is how they try to capture the, uh, uh, the, the independence uh, element. So they they have uh, developed this index um, and uh, have applied um, to um, a number of uh, um, uh, you know central banks across the world, less so um, uh, to emerging central uh, emerging market central banks. So that's what we have uh, done. Uh, if you're familiar with the score, the, the index, the max score is 15, which is this. And we see the progress from actually 1998, for which we have uh, data. The red line again is emerging markets from below five, they more than doubled their rate uh, until the last uh, observation, because obviously, you know, this data is, is, is uh, not very up to date uh, until 20, 
2020 or so. And pretty much caught us to the to, uh, to other uh, uh, central banks. The Bank of England, we sure the Bank of England is the highest, but also the ECB and the Fed. And in fact, some on this measure, some emerging markets uh, close their gap relative to uh, to comparators and as country comparators, these are so put up in terms of you know average um, uh, score uh, at the end of the observation period. These included the Czech Republic, uh, Chile, Hungary, South Korea actually, and uh, South Africa. South Korea, I apologize, we kept it in the emerging market database. Obviously, that and Israel more than emerged, and now they are um, advanced countries. But because we start so much back, we kept them. I mean, there is a structural uh, issue in that. Um, now, of course, I want to, one more point. This is just shows this uh, graph the progress across uh, countries and, and indicators, and it pretty much across all the dimension, but uh, basically the, the introduction of monetary policy targets, policy transparency has increased, and economic transparency, better disclosure of uh, macroeconomic models uh, and numerical forecasts uh, presented. Um, now, how much is reality? Is a little reality check is, is important. If you are familiar with any of these countries, uh, uh, um, I we just had a nice presentation in this very room on uh, South Africa, and and there were some questions raised about uh, you know whether it's still not fiscally dominant. More than central banks that don't operate in, in a fiscally dominant sense. Um, obviously, uh, you know it, what is de facto and the euro may be a little bit different, but be it as it may, I think even on the South Africa or I know my original home country, Hungary, that there are a lot of issues, but at least the framework is there um, to, uh, that, uh, that shows this increased uh, transparency. So pretty much uh, catching up to advanced countries in this. Uh, now, the readability index is the plus uh, Kincaid uh, uh, index that we use. Um, it uh, measures through the length of the sentence and the third length, this is one variant, obviously, you could use others. We, we, we chose to go with the definition and, and the available database and extended it to our sample. Um, uh, measures the readability of, uh, of, of, of the uh, policy statements uh, that we look at. And it, what, what it shows is, uh, this is the line sort of the 10th, 12th grade um, required to understand and uh, you know, decipher central bank communication. Um, and it goes up to graduate grade, which is obviously very high, and uh, relatively small portion of the population would have that. Now, here again, the red line um, is uh, emerging markets, and what it shows that this has been reasonably um, constant over time uh, since the data 2004, um, as I said. Um, reasonably uh, stable and below some college level. Uh, you know, the share of college, uh, college or some or, or, uh, college degrees or bachelor, I was checking in emerging market is below 50%. So it means it's a part of the population, but another part it catches. Um, for advanced countries, the US is the solid black line. Uh, we see that it actually uh, was pretty readable. And then came the global financial crisis. And I think all the co complication that came with, with, with communicating the QE, then the taper tantrum and episodes of the sort, and, and the readability of the statements uh, on this measure um, uh, really worsened. So the higher you go, the more difficult. So required higher, higher um, uh, education level too. To, to understand the statement. So it is uh, showed up and uh, the ECB um, was um, kind of a little bit, so again, higher is worse in this, uh, was also um, pretty demanding at the beginning and uh, we know that, that, that policy framework also uh, is not uh, that easy to, to communicate. And they also um, um, uh, worsened actually um, uh, later. Um, but, in the last 
two or three years, and I think it's, we can get back to the, uh, the mandate review of both uh, central banks that uh, took place uh, 2020, 2021, 2022. Uh, they, um, they graph or index shows a downwards uh, uh, slope, which means it improves, it requires less level of education to understand the statements. And, um, and pretty much today, you know, emerging market uh, and, and advanced central bank's statement readability is similar. It still requires a certain college level. Uh, so in terms of, you know, communicating what you want to do and why you are doing it is still probably a challenge, but uh, central banks, advanced world, emerging markets seem to be facing a similar, similar level of, uh, of challenge. Now, this is the point when I give the, the floor to Olga. Uh, she is uh, um, hopefully, hopefully I'm up. Uh, great, good to see you all. Right, so just to recap, our focus is on uh, statements and communication. So previously we started with the simpler me metric of readability and it told a certain story. Now let's uh, let's dive in into the statements. So for the what we're doing first is sentiment analysis, and we base methodology very much on the DIS paper, which is um, monetary policy press releases and international comparison that was published a couple of years ago. Uh, and it's a dictionary based method. So um, I know uh, there will be machine learning a bit later, but let's start with the dictionary method. Um, so the way it works is uh, you set up a, a dictionary of uh, nouns and modifiers. Modifiers could be uh, adverbs um, or sorry ad adjectives of verbs and based on the confluence of the two you can derive the coefficient of reduction spectrum um i know it's multiple but here here's some examples right um so first of all we take the sentence from the statement we break it down into simpler parts just to make sure we get a correct measurement of coefficient of then we look for nouns which can be direct or reverse very simple example of director yeah Sorry, I want to uh, break this, but uh, did you only consider English? Uh, I knew this question was coming. <laughs> yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, yeah, we only took the official English translations, yes. Okay, yeah, yeah. So maybe if I can, uh, since we are time, so that's an excellent question. Um, uh, because we, my center is usually translated into English. Yeah. It's their own translation. Mm -hmm. So uh, you have to trust that the that clarity of what we were working with English, which the product mm -hmm. of the translation is reasonably reflects the sentiment of, of the original language. Of course, yeah. Um, we hope that's the case, and, mm -hmm. and uh, we run, run some uh, comparisons, sort of random, we mm -hmm. get the original language, and, 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 and that seemed to be the case. But in any compa international comparison mm -hmm. based on text, this is like a challenge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, sure, a good question. Yeah, that's a good challenge. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, yeah, go, going back. Um, so nouns. First, we have a dictionary of nouns. Nouns are divided into direct and reverse. Very simple examples of direct nouns would be prices and reverses unemployment. Prices go up. You should be more hawkish. Unemployment goes up. Should be more dovish. All right. No How question. do you deal with negation? Um, yeah, it's part of, uh, yeah, definitely looking for negations in, uh, in, uh, in the sentence. So if it says no downward yes. pressure on prices, I'll say downward. So it says no downward pressure. Yeah, no downward pressure. yeah, yeah it was the part of the algorithm. So okay. no downward and support. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Negation reverses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good point. Um, just wanted to, uh, to give like a highlight on that in here. Um, yeah. Okay, so nouns and then obviously modifiers, um, positive or negative, yeah, good point. So just upwards, downwards, or not upward, not downward, uh, all taken care of here. Um, and eventually that uh, lets us derive of a score. It's either plus one, minus one, zero for each uh, small sub sentence on the sentence. And then we just take the average for the whole of the statement. Um, Sorry, just yeah. to clarify, yeah. when you're saying something is double shock, it should mean what would be the appropriate policy stance if what that was saying is true. Right, so if it's hawkish, she would expect an interest rate increase. Yeah. It's that just an interest rate uh, cost. Okay. Yeah. Lucid in what I Yeah. So, or um, QE, um, increase or decrease. Yeah. 
So, yeah, once again, uh, I think like upward pressure on prices is definitely going really classic example of things very like hard to ship. Essential banks are flooded. But we discuss more of what the implications are um, later. Okay, so then this measure allows us to quantify like average sentiment of the statement. So the statement has a lot of information, a lot of maybe fewer words, you know, fewer sentences, but on average, we can drive um, the score. It typically goes from minus one to plus one, but uh, rarely, you know, the whole statement will just con consist of hawkish or dovish sentiments. And this is um, where we compare the general uh, stance across our countries, so Fed, ECB, and emerging markets. Again, yeah, emerging markets are red, Fed is black, ECB is gray. And we were relieved to find that um, the picture is very much in line with the intuition or understanding of how um, things unraveled over the last uh, 20 years. So for example, when the great financial crisis started, emerging markets entered it, uh, in a bit of more hawkish stance compared to the US. Took a bit longer maybe to go into dovish territory, so go to zero. Um, then uh, we see this episode where ECB decided to tighten before others, before uh, Fed did. Uh, but then uh, uh, the debt crisis started in 2011, they had to cut again, uh, go back to being dovish and more accommodative um, in monetary policy. Um, before before COVID, uh, we had a pretty um, hawkish Fed um, compared to ECB. ECB was still concerned with the equation here. But then when COVID started, there was a very, very concerted reaction. Everybody reacted the same way. Everybody turned very, very dodge very quickly. Obviously, when COVID started happening. But then the most interesting part, right, is uh, what happened after, well, after people started being concerned about inflation um, caused by all the factors that happened during COVID. And here you see that emerging markets started becoming and became hawkish so much earlier than Fed, well, than ECB and especially Fed. So Fed is the black line here. Um, and uh, what's interesting, like even now, emerging markets continue uh, being like they are on a very stable trajectory as, as of now towards dovishness and uh, maybe being concerned with economic recovery. Whereas Fed and ECB, they're kind of oscillating and maybe like reversing a little bit going back to being hawkish. Um, Essentially, due to maybe delayed uh, reaction. And this chart is just a, um, a version of the previous one, just gives you the difference between emerging markets and the uh, Fed. And here it's, it is just very, very striking, right? How fast emerging markets react here. It's very steep compared to Fed, very clear. And um, you can, you can even compare, say, to, to the financial crisis of 2008, maybe the level, the differential is uh, is very similar, but the stories are still very different, right? Um, here, emerging markets reacted first, and um, that's the word, like, the, well, not front, front runners in this case. Um, well, I think another thing maybe you would notice on the chart is that Emerging markets do on average tend to be more hawkish than the Fed, but that's probably just like part of reality and uh, persistent inflation for all of them. Um, okay, I know, I know this charts will be very busy, but uh, bear with me for a second. Um, so we continue with our methodology of the dictionary based approach, but um, if you recall, there were some nouns that uh, we uh, had in our dictionary. Now, nouns can be grouped into certain topics, right? Um, prices, CPI, RPI, inflation is like inflation topic. Unemployment, labor market, jobs would be a labor topic. Consumer spending and so on will be an uh, activity topic. So we have a lot of topics that it's probably going to treat here. So inflation, labor, economic activity, QE, quantitative design, and forward guidance. Um, so we break it down and like divide the sentiment into those subtopics. Now, what is very, very interesting here, right, is even if you look at those charts, um, where not much is seen is uh, how strikingly different United States and emerging markets are in that there's a lot 
going on in the US. Um, let's zoom in. Actually, let's go to the US first. You see that um, the Fed can be uh, simultaneously hawkish on inflation, but concerned about economic growth. Also, maybe thinking that the labor market, the dark blue, is overheating, which can warrant maybe policy action. Then there is a point QE part, the forward guidance part that drags you into more dovish territory. So, like, overall sentiment is just like an ad of something that is positive, something that is negative. It's maybe sometimes confusing. Um, Contrast to emerging markets, much clearer. You see that usually all the topics that emerging markets discuss, they point in the same direction. And maybe there are just two main topics that are concerned about so inflation and economic activity. Everything else is like just so tiny you can barely see it on the chart. And no contradiction, no ambiguity. Maybe there, there is some time, but very, very little. So much simpler, much clearer communication. Um, now you can say, well, of course, maybe economic reality is very complicated. Okay, that's okay. Economic reality might be very complicated, which warrants, you know, like this complex communication. But I think what we also show using machine learning is that um, this complex communication can lead to ambiguity and maybe misunderstanding of what the central bank is trying to say. Um, but again, there's a lot of going on, and it's like very unclear what the central bank is planning to do. So we use um, embeddings-based approach uh, using state-of-the-art um, um, NLP models, and we try to use them to capture inflation sentiment, right? So let's go back, right? We have just the inflation component of the sentiment, the red, red thing here, and we try to compare two measures. The one that we derived using dictionary, the gray line, and the one that we derived using machine learning. And the simpler the communication, the more aligned those metrics will be. What we find with the United States here, uh, so here we show how aligned two metrics are. Like we use two approaches and try to quantify the same thing. And so during COVID, it's very strikingly, everything was very highly correlated. So emerging markets on average 60% correlation, ECB 70. But the United States is close to zero. It's very confusing what's been going on. Turkey is another outlier, but probably not so surprising. Um, can you give an example of what would make the two measures more aligned? And if you use like so, in terms of like what's actually going on with the machine learning, um, an example of what would uh, simpler communication and non contradictory uh, statements. If um, I think if um, the Fed can be talking about price increases but also being concerned about I don't know, wage growth potentially that can confuse machine learning because maybe wages and uh, price prices are very related. Um, and therefore, it's getting confused. Because but, basically, the machine learning algorithm isn't doing what you're doing, which is kind of breaking lots of topics. No, no, it, we're just asking it, okay, what, um, how correlated is the statement with inflation concern? And that's what we do. Okay, is there inflation concern here? And um, it fails to pick it up. Okay, I'm mindful of time, what should we focus on right here? This is good. So <laughs> right, right, interesting. Um, okay, so um, well, so now we have all the you know sentiment metrics. Um, how do we use them? Okay, to gauge policy actions. So first, you know, we have inflation sentiment, like the one that is that was read on this chart, and we try to see okay if it's uh, correlated with inflation, and the central banks foresee inflation, or do they react to it? And what we do is we take uh, seasonally adjusted inflation, which is um, a gray here on the chart and inflation component, which is red. And then we like shift to the two time series until we achieve maximal correlation and see at which line this happens. Um, so what we find is that um, central banks typically react to inflation. So it starts happening and then they start talking about it. Uh, there are a few ones that seem to foresee inflation, um, Hungary and South Africa, Romania and Czech Republic, but the vast majority is more like uh, reactionary. And then the second part, okay, now that you uh, say assessed what's going on with the economy, and then you have like this sentiment, which can be dovish hawkish, like how correlated is it with actual policy action? Um, and again, very similar analysis, just like shifting the two time series until we get maximum uh, correlation. But we find that central banks, it's in line with a lot of other studies. Central banks uh, give a lot of heads up, six to 10, maybe more months before they uh, actually implement the policy change. But then the strength of the signals of the correlation between the two lines 
um, it is where actually we find emerging markets fall a little bit shorter of the developed counterparts. So the strength of the signal is a bit um, weaker and we identify as an area of improvement for central banks. So just maybe to recap the previous one, communication was super clear um, in terms of strength of the signal, maybe like a little bit of work needs to be done. Um, maybe yeah. I'm here. Yep. Then maybe I'll just wrap up because you don't have time. Um, and I say just one sentence, just stay here. On exchange rate, uh, emerging markets naturally uh, focus more, even if they are inflation targeters. So with those who, you know, are uh, what on this topic, you know, you still have to focus uh, in the, as, as I mentioned, the, the, the emerging markets and the others, of course not. Supply side factors, you find that uh, um, if you act as food, food and energy, emerging markets uh, focus more on the supply side. And it's quite important because they reacted for the first round effects and that served them well in this uh, context. Forward guidance, you heard, uh, maybe you remember Guillermo Ortiz, um, uh, you know, Personally, I also think it was a huge mistake to have for forward guidance. You cannot say like the, the Reserve Bank of Australia said in 2020, 2020 March, that for four years, it will not change the policy rate. <laughs> for four years. But he was almost sucked and they just changed the whole framework. Uh, you may have seen. So uh, that's probably, you know, that type of soul searching would be healthy in other central banks, they don't really expect. Um, but emerging markets luckily never used forward guidance in a, in a very comical way. But it's silly forward market that, you know, but they try to mean, but not really. And we give other examples so you can go into that. Fiscal policy is another interesting thing in my mind, because in the end, uh, today, we really should be talking about policies when we look at the, but particularly crisis management. Fiscal policy together with monetary policy. So we kind of tested this actually humongous database uh, that Olga and, and, and uh, other collaborators put together. And uh, what we see that the US basically doesn't mention fiscal policy. Many statements. Interestingly, the ECB does, but in a very descriptive way. So that's good. It's, you know, refers that, you know, fiscal deficit increases or not, but, but it doesn't, um, you know, value, put value judgment. Uh, whereas emerging markets are a little bit more proactive. I am gonna skip the lessons. You have to read the paper or get our, our, our because it's it's about to be published. Um, but I think in terms of policy lessons, maybe that would be interesting because any research and you know it goes as much as, as them then we can really um relate it to a policy work. So it's very clear as Olga uh, explained that. All, all central banks, emerging market or advanced market, need to improve their inflation projection. They lack, we had to say, maybe went so a little bit too fast, but to say, see, say, act. Um, nobody, no central bank really forecasts inflation. If they just communicate with the lag when it, it is happening. Um, then a second uh, is that they all, signal the policy change as, as also Olga uh, described, uh, but the emerging markets are, are falling short of that in advanced countries. And forward guidance, I just said, um, you know, it is just, I, I think it's detrimental in general because it, you know, cuts your data dependency and that is not good for credibility, but it is definitely very detrimental at the time of rapid change. Um, uh, Central banks with multiple mandates need to have a little, uh, you know, more focus when they communicate at the time of stress, which is the primary check. Um, as, as Olga alluded to, and as, as you know uh, from recent economic history, the Fed was pretty ambivalent. Actually, uh, Dan Cohn uh, was also very good today. Uh, I mean, he's excellent, obviously, but he was you know, very um, uh, clearly pointed out the problem that the communication when inflation started to come up was that, you know, the labor market is, you know, maximum employment was the, was the objective. And, and there was really no, no focus on inflation. So there was a lot of confusion in the US. Multiple targets, when you have a stress and targets, you know, the, the two, you know, mandate objectives, Clash, which actually, you know, we see that there is uh, attention today. Um, it, 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 the communication has to be clear. Uh, the distinction between first and second round effects, you know, this is, of course, an art, as central bankers here, here know. 
Uh, but this, uh, or, you know, traditional distinction that you don't uh, react to the first round effects only, uh, only the second round effects or so the stop the, the spillovers, particularly uh, through, through wages, it is really not very relevant when inflation shoots up very quickly and uh, expectations can be the anchor. Uh, and finally, maybe I, I just put the last, uh, last one. You know, central bank, I'm a big advocate of this, so you know, whether that's right or wrong, but, but, but they should be transparent about how they, not only what they see in the fiscal, uh, fiscal world, but what's happening in a descriptive manner, but they really should focus on, on how they, and communicate it, how they coordinate. Right, uh, I mean the fiscal rates. During COVID time, as we know that there was a tremendous uh, coordination, um, not, only, not only in the advanced world, also in emerging markets uh, to mount uh, an, 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 an anti cyclical uh, joint package. And that was what was required, that was the right policy, but it was really not communicated in central bank communication. And that undermines uh, a little bit, you know, the, the, the credibility. And we believe that some joint poly somebody <laughs> should look at, at the policy mix and, and look at the assessment uh, of the policy mix, uh, because this type of clear communication on the joint effect of fiscal and monetary policy, the policy mix, would really have the credibility of both the monetary and the fiscal policy. Thank you. Thank you for the great Oh, sorry, wait, 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 Okay, um, so I want to thank the organizer for putting the paper on the program, and um, uh, I should give the usual disclaimer that the presentation does not represent the views of the Fed, the boss of the Fed. Um, so what I'm presenting today is look, thinking about, broadly speaking, still um, what kind of signals that uh, central banks are sending with their um, uh, policy actions. So. Communication on some level, but in a very in a much more abstract sense than the, the first paper. So the the title of the paper is "Interest Rate Surprises: A Tale of Two Shocks" and its joint work with uh, two co-authors, Ricardo Nunez at Surrey and Ali Asami at the Dallas Fed. So the motivation. Um, Okay, the motivation of the paper is um, broadly to understand what the effects of monetary policy are. Um, and so just to quickly kind of review what the problem is, and many of you, for many of you, this might be um, repeated things you've already seen, but what I'm going to call um, identification 1.0 is an earlier strand of the literature that attempted to uh, remove anticipated um, endogenous movements of policy using only a surprise component. However, the issue with um, some of these identification methods is that surprises themselves can still contain uh, multiple components that have different effects on the economy. And so the um, one version of um, what I'm going to call identification 2.0, where you try to disentangle the different uh, components, one version of that is simply looking at target and path, what people call target and path components of monetary policy surprises. And so um, where path you might think of including both forward guidance and QE, or you can do things to separate out um, those two subcomponents. There's another strand of the literature now that's um, looking at 
separating to other things in the surprises, which are um, what I'm going to call information shocks versus pure monetary shocks. And by information, what I'm talking about is still the endogenous component of monetary policy, but it's an unanticipated um, uh, endogenous component. So the key um, idea in this paper is to try to achieve that identification uh, using a method that's new to the literature where we look at um, macro data releases uh, as a way of, uh, as an events that provide information on the state of the economy, but there's no pure monetary shock um, as part of those macro data releases by design. And so our strategy will be twofold. First, we're going to identify information shocks from AVAR using external instruments, where here the external instrument that we use are interest rate changes around macro news events. Um, so this is exactly these interest rate changes we think of um, as capturing the perceived future policy responses to exogenous information about the economy. Um, and then the second part of the strategy is then we use those identified information shocks to clean uh, the information component out of um, the what the literature has traditionally used in terms of these uh, interest rate surprises around FLC and so just to maybe interrupt. Uh, so instrument, so the instrument that you propose in the interest rate moment is around micronews, but it's so expected to be uncorrelated with uh, which part? Uncorrelated with um, the uh, monetary policy shocks themselves. Mm -hmm. That's that's really the key. Um, they should also be uncorrelated with other shocks in the system, but I think the one we care most about is the monetary policy. Um, it's related to a number of different um, literatures. So there are there are a bunch of papers doing various types of empirical work on central bank information shocks. Um, the most Papers most related to our paper and um, that literature would be the Yaroshinsky Karate paper um, from 2020 and the Miranda Agropino Rico paper 2021. They use um, different methods of identifying these two components, which I'll um, talk about in more detail in a, a couple of slides. And we're also using methodology from the external instrument VAR literature. And our methodology most closely follows. Um, uh, one of the methods in the Laksvala 2019 paper, but um, that paper was looking at a different um, context, but the um, the kind of a, the econometric technique is, has similarities. Um, and we're also related to the literature that uses macro data releases. Um, I think the key difference is that we're one of the first papers to not um, just look at the surprise in the macro variable itself. So let's say the the surprise in the unemployment rate announcement or something like that, but we're actually looking at the interest rate movement around that event instead. So first I'm going to just go through, um, I shouldn't even call it a model, it's a framework, um, and the estimation method. So essentially the, the framework we have in mind is that you have a policy interest rate IT, that's driven by some systematic policy response um, to, uh, here we've written it as expectations about XT. So think of that as capturing the state of the economy. We've written an expectations term there um, to uh, be general, but of course it could be contemporaneous or uh, logs information as well. Um, and so the, the policy rate reacts to this um, state of the economy with some uh, parameter phi. And we're going to allow for time variation in that parameter. Um, just uh, basically, it's not crucial, but it, our method allows uh, can capture time variation in this thing and a uh, policy shock. Um, this excellent MP that that's what I mean when I say pure policy shock. So focusing on the interest rate change around certain events, if you look at the change in the interest rate around F1C announcement, this delta sub F notation, um, it's going to capture phi T times the change um, around those announcements in your assessments of the economy, or it could also capture um, the change in the, uh, the reaction function itself that you might be learning from the policy announcement times the state of the economy 
and the uh, pure uh, policy shock. So in general, all of these three things can be going on, and that's why you can't use this um, overall interest rate surprise um, as a way of just estimating the effects of the pure policy shock itself, because the other um, components in there might have different effects on the economy. On um, data release days, so what I'm going to um, notate with this delta sub D for data, the uh, monetary policy shock is absent by design. Of course, in the data, of course, there are times when an important data release comes on the same day as a, a policy announcement, and we exclude um, those days from our um, our backward-used instrument. So, so we do construct an instrument that um, satisfies um, that um, assumption. Yeah, um, starting a bit with like the time index for the reaction coefficient, because the way I think about monetary policy shocks is that some sort of mistake that monetary policy is coming from like an optimum, yeah. right? And if you have time varying coefficient, this seems to be also a bit arbitrary, right? Like in the sense that you deviate from the optimum when you when you change the, the reaction. But you're implicitly assuming that the optimum is constant, where, right. where as it might not be, right? So for example, if you think that, um, just one example would be if you really think that the Phillips curve is flattening over time, that there are some structural changes going on in the economy, the optimal monetary policy reaction could also change. And on a more practical level, I think what it also captures is things like the zero load graph, um, mm -hmm. just as an example. So I, I don't think we're taking a stand on that. We're just saying that if you believe for some reason that these reaction coefficients might be changing over time, the instrument that we construct allows for that. It's yeah. robust to that. Yeah, just to follow up on this, um, how do you constrain this temporary ability to efficient? Otherwise, would you be completely allowed to gain anything like this once a number is part of the problem? Yeah, so, um, so the way we allow for it is basically just by, uh, it's by measuring the change in the interest rate as our instrument instead of using data on this thing. Right, so we're, in a sense, we're not estimating the phi t mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. um, instead, what we're taking is that on macro release days, by taking the movement in the market interest rate, you're capturing how the market thinks that the interest rate is going to react. It doesn't matter. Um, they, the market has some coefficient in mind, and we don't need to estimate mm -hmm. that coefficient. That's how we, that's how our method kind of allows for phi to be type varying, but without needing to estimate that thing, which I agree can have a cognitive challenge. So do we include the, say, the speeches by the chair or other major announcements from that amount necessary, the FOMC announcement? So in our, so when we consider like using our information chat to clean an FOMC instruments, the, um, then estimate effects of the policy shock. We don't do it at that stage. But what we do, um, not in what I'm showing today, but as a robustness check, is when we construct this thing, when we construct the, um, the data release instrument, we have a version where we exclude not only days that overlap with FOMC announcements, but also days that overlap with speeches by the chair and also the, uh, other um, members of the, uh, the board of government. So actually, you mentioned the um, literature from like the science and uh, now there is a paper by Arnold Swanson mm -hmm. who is entitled with this kind of information on them, just to give pure information as like Arnold Swanson say or some Fed response as Arnold Swanson say. So actually, the motivation for this is saying actually I don't I don't believe they are correct to extract this information from them that I do. And do in a better way using the some some exogenous response to interest rates. Yeah. So I think taking Nakamura science in as a baseline, are you referring to their I don't remember what year was published, 2018, the QJ paper? So there they don't try to separate at all, right? They just take the whole um uh, interest rate surprise, they construct like a first principal component of a few interest rate surprises actually around the FOMC announcement. 
And they say it looks like when we look at the responses to this thing that there is an information component in there that it's actually kind of polluting um, the response because it, it looks like a linear combination of both um, uh, the theoretical response to a pair of monetary shock and what a theoretical response to an information component would be. So what Bauer and Swanson do is they actually, they clean, um, I think basically what they're claiming to clean out is, is more this, this term, right? So they don't um, actually believe that there is an information shock. So they, they don't believe that um, markets are updating their beliefs about the economy around FOMC announcements. So for them, this term, they would assume is zero. And they say that what they're, what they're actually finding is that the market is disagreeing about the Fed's um, reaction function. And so for them, um, they have this term in there, which they clean by using data on um, basically the macro announcements themselves. And, um, and so um, I think what we're doing though is a more comprehensive thing because we are allowing there's an information component. And this is, I'm actually glad you asked this question because what we we do capture to the extent that this term is there that there's some updating about the um the, the reaction function what we capture is a form of endogenous updating about the reaction function so if um the policy reaction function is non-linear for some reason um and the macro data release um, itself uh, makes uh, the market update their beliefs about the reaction function. We're capturing that aspect of it, the endogenous part of it. What we're not capturing is the exo an exogenous shock, if you wish, to the phi T. So, it, and here, what I mean by exogenous is really like a central banker, you know, Jay Powell woke up and decided that he needed to react more. Um, to inflation for a reason that's not related to the, the state of the economy, just randomly. We're not capturing that because that's not happening on a day when like the BLS releases the unemployment rate, for example. Um, and we think that that's actually a strength of this um, framework because that a shock like that can have an entirely different effect on the economy um, than um, a, a, simply an information um, shock. And so, so we don't capture that. And what's happening in the Bauer and Swanson framework is when they clean that out of the interest rate surprise, um, they're basically getting that this component can look like an information shock because of um, because it's basically uh, not clean instruments, right? They don't have an information shock that's having real effects on the economy. What they what they're getting is like. This thing looks like an information shock response because it's a bias in the estimation. So what I'm going to show today is that even just cleaning out what we're we think of as a true update in information and a true information shock and an endogenous um, uh, surprise to the policy of local coefficient, what you're left with gives you uh, responses that look like a pure monetary policy surprise or a pure monetary shock. Um, what the theory would predict. Okay. So um, even though I talked about it a bit already, just to be super clear about it, what the uh, the key idea is that we have an instrument that is the interest rate change um, on the days of uh, important macro announcements, um, data releases, and this this instrument is a valid instrument by itself to identify an information shock. And importantly, we're using the interest rate change around macro announcements and not the more commonly used announcement price itself, because this allows us to kind of more um, uh, generally capture the market perceived uh, systematic response without estimating a response function. Um, I think another nice thing about it is it's the same market participants that kind of um, generate the FOMC announcement surprises, right? When you use these um, announcement surprises, this data comes from um, surveys of um, forecasters, what they think like certain data releases will be. These aren't the same people who are trading the Fed funds futures that generate the um, interest rate surprises. So by using um, those same futures to measure uh, changes around macro announcements, we're um, more accurate 
accurately capturing um, the perceived um, policy reaction function of the same group of people. Um, and doing this also allows us to capture all of the relevant information in a macro announcement, not just the headline numbers for which you have these announcements of price data. So these announcements of price data, you might have it for headline numbers like the unemployment rate or the non-farm payroll um, change, but there's a lot of other information in these data releases that are that you don't have surprises for, but will be kind of digested by the market and um, will show up in the interest rate change ground. Um, and then we use the same kind of FOMC announcement um, uh, surprises that are used um, in the um, in other papers in the literature. But what we do is we um, basically clean out the part that's correlated with the information shock that we identify using the first instrument. Um, okay, and so one implicit assumption that we're making here is that shocks to policy relevant macro information, this kind of state of the economy, are captured in a single uh, dimension. But this this in, implicit assumption, I think, is supported in other work that um, uses this uh, data. Okay, so compared to existing identification methods um, in the literature, compared to sign restrictions, we don't have to assume the direction of the effects of either of the shocks on any of the variables. So um, I think that's a that's a strength relative to uh, that literature because essentially there uh, the problem that we're avoiding is that even theory will predict that the stock price response to a macro announcement. Um, can be of an ambiguous sign or it can be state dependent due to the competing cash flow and discount rate effects. And so, um, so even theory would not predict a strict kind of sign restriction. And so um, it's, um, I think um, I like this method better because it avoids having to use a sign restriction uh, versus other papers that use uh, projections of the uh, interest rate surprises on forecast differences, basically we don't have to assume anything about what information is conveyed by these um, FOMC statements. Okay, and so um, how we estimate this is basically, um, I think in the interest of time, I'm not going to go too much into the equations, but we estimate a standard reduced form of VAR using Bayesian methods, and we have now two instruments, the uh, data release, uh, interest rate changes around data releases and uh, the interest rate change around FOMC announcements that jointly satisfy some relevance and exclusion conditions for this set of two shocks, but both the information shock and the pure monetary shock. And our key assumption is that one of our instruments, this data release instrument, is not uh, correlated with the pure monetary shock. And this is this is by design because we're taking only data releases that are not overlapping with key um, set communications. And every, all the other, uh, uh, the, basically the correlations between the, the FOMC um, announcement surprise and the two shocks can be unrestricted. And so this can be implemented as a two-step proxy VAR. Um, basically, the first step is to just use um, the data release instrument, which is a valid instrument for the information shock to identify the information shock. And then we use um, that information shock to then clean the FOMC analysis surprise, and then use that clean surprise to identify the uh, monetary monetary. Okay. Um, and so just some details about the data. Um, this is pretty much a, a, a pretty standard specification. Um, I think the only thing I want to note is that in our baseline um, analysis, we're using uh, announcements of um, labor recognition. So the BLS employment report and um, jobless claims. We do uh, robustness checks that use a, um, a wider set of macro data releases. Um, okay. So just to get into the results, um, just first stage F stats of our employment news uh, data release instruments for the information shop has a very high um, F stat of uh, over 163. And then once we construct a cleaned FOC announcement, um, 
surprise that has uh, an excess of 16.4. And these first are the reaction of uh, the uh, one year treasury rates to each of the two shocks. And one interesting result that emerges here is that basically the information shock is the shock. So this is information about the state of the economy. This um, generates a very persistent um, response of the one year interest rate, which kind of just, um, it, it's really a statement about the persistence of shocks to the state of the economy in general. I think that, um, that when something happens, the Fed is kind of, the Fed is expected to react to this thing over a fairly long period of time. And once you clean um, the information shock out of the uh, policy surprise, you end up identifying a pure monetary shock that is um, a lot less persistent, it's fairly transitory, which kind of makes sense. If these are supposed to be just like monetary policy errors, you would like to hope that those are not persistent um, errors. And then in terms of the reaction of the macro economy, now they react in ways that I think um, are consistent with theory. So both prices and um, here it's industrial production respond negatively to pure monetary policy shocks and positively to information about the economy that would cause um, a positive interest rate response. So um, maybe in the language of the previous paper, kind of hog issues about the economy. And then if you look at uh, financial variables, uh, the excess bond premium, so a measure of um, risk premium in corporate bonds, rises sharply in response to monetary shocks and it falls um, with information shocks. And similarly, stock prices fall with monetary, monetary shocks and rise with information shocks. So everything kind of goes in the direction that would be predicted by theory. Um, if you then compare what we have to what you would get if you try to identify monetary shocks using just the overall, um, let's call it dirty monetary policy surprise, then um, first you see that the monetary using the overall monetary policy surprise, you would think that the monetary policy shock itself is very uh, is more persistent because it's kind of a mix of both a very persistent information shock and a pure monetary shock, which um, might not be um, you know that I think seeing something like this is not as consistent with a view that these are truly like uh, errors, simple banking errors. Um, and if you use this purifying monetary uh, surprise to identify the shock instead, you find that both uh, prices and production responses are about twice as large as what you would recover if you use just the overall monetary policy surprise. And um, similarly for the financial variables as well. Basically, once you do the cleaning exercise, the reactions um, are in the right direction and they're about twice as big. Um, then you can kind of compare the identified monetary policy shocks themselves. And so what we have here, I know it's hard to see because we have a lot of um, monthly data points here, but the, the blue bars are the um, what we identify as the pure monetary policy shock. And the orange bars are the, the quote unquote shock you would identify using the overall monetary policy surprise. And so what we find is that the, the pure monetary shock that you identify from the bar is about 60% smaller than, than the shock that you would identify um, using if you had used the overall monetary policy surprise instead. So what this is saying is that using our identification, the Fed isn't making as many mistakes or as large mistakes as you would think if you um, use the traditional um, identification. And we also find that the overall uh, monetary policy surprise identifies a, a quote unquote shock that actually has a correlation of about 30% with the um, with what we identify as an information shock. So there is um, an information component in there um, that's that's sizable. So does it show that the monetary shock is smaller and less frequent after the right after the session? Um, yeah, I don't think I, we haven't um, done kind of summary statistics over subsamples to see if 
if it's like significantly smaller, I think just bearing up this graph, that could be the case. But I think what we're seeing is that um, maybe just overall, the the the, um, the monetary policy is just a little bit. Right, that's what we need to see yeah, yeah, potentially. Right, because we're using the, I think following the literature, we, in our baseline specification, use the three month ahead federal funds future. So it captures basically the, the current meeting and the next meeting. But um, I agree during the zero lower bound period that you might want to think about a longer term thing and we have a robust Um, So just getting to the robustness checks, we can look at the response to those other variables. I think for our purposes, um, for the story about the information check, it's important to look at something like uh, GDP forecast, for example. And so here we have the one quarter head um, forecast of GDP from Blue Chip, um, the consensus forecast. And you see that they react um, negatively to pure monetary shocks and positively to information shocks. So that goes in the direction that we, uh, that theory would predict. Um, we can use hours worked instead of industrial production as a more comprehensive measure of the entire um, economy and not just um, uh, primarily manufacturing and that um, the results go through there as well. Um, as I was mentioning, we can use uh, kind of one year ahead euro dollar future instead of the Fed funds future uh, changes on macro announcement days. So this identifies, I think, more of an information path shock because you're identifying basically information that the market expects the Fed to react to over the entire next year instead of just one of the next, instead of the current or next meeting. Um, that also um, gives uh, similar uh, results and using a broader set of macro announcements. Um, which basically includes more types of information that the Fed can respond to also give similar results. Um, in both of these robustness checks, I think an interesting thing is that the, the first stage F statistic of the cleaned FOMC announcement surprise becomes smaller because we're removing basically, because by broadening the definition of the information shock, we, are, we progressively remove even more variation from the monetary policy surprise itself. And so that that's one main reason why it's neither of these are our baseline case because the uh, first stage F staff for the pure monetary policy um, uh, surprise um, instrument actually falls below 10 in some of these cases. But qualitatively speaking, the estimated impulse responses are the same. Um, we can also just completely exclude the ZLB period um, from the analysis that delivers similar results as well, um, just with slightly wider confidence bands. And we can use Bayesian over projections instead of LMR to produce um, emotional responses that are also qualitatively the same. Um, so we do a couple of other robustness checks. So I think for our instrument that we're using, um, it's natural to be a little bit more careful about the timing of the information set since we're considering an instrument that where it's actually in this month, um, you know, the BLS is announcing what employment was in the previous month. And so we um, run a version of the VAR, which is, which is not standard. That's why this is not our baseline specification, but I think um, it's a little bit more careful about the information set by using only the lags of the uh, macro variables instead of the current um, macro variable, because really in real time, you only have information about uh, the lag variable. Um, and the results are also still qualitatively uh, the same. Um, and in that specification, we even include uh, forecasts of the of the um, current um, month's value, and even those react um, in the ways that are predicted by theory. And then uh, lastly, we do a version that further residualizes the um, data release um, surprise instrument with the lags of the bar residual. And um, just in case there's any additional concern that that instrument is not um, purely capturing the new information about um, the macroeconomy. And again, the results are qualitatively similar. 
So to conclude, uh, what we have in this paper is um, we have uh, a new way of identifying macro information shocks and uh, therefore cleaning uh, monetary policy surprise series. And the effects are both robust and economically meaningful and go in the direction um, uh, predicted by theory. Um, but arguably, like, we think we're using uh, weaker assumptions than some of the other existing literature. Now we will take up your questions. One thing that is not clear here is that suppose today is the announcement, right? And whatever surprise, and then the data release was to say quarter ago, and there was some kind of surprise you meant it this way. You're basically saying that that's past surprise, data surprise was not priced in the market by the markets, right? Because the markets are surprised, and a lot of their surprise can be explained in your first stage by surprisingly fast. So that's it's only it's only that I, I don't understand why is it. I mean, it's it, it, it looks like that's the case, but then why would it be the case? That the, I mean, it's been in the past. Everything is observed. Data is observed by the markets. Why can they do it? One way to check it is instead of measuring surprise, just put controls for the say CPI release CPI data. And wouldn't that do the job? Consider what would be true if they perceived gamma to be something else. All of ours would still go through. Okay. Um, with these two things, we get this sort of um, standard result that uh, a subject's updated expectation after having seen the central bank signal should just be this precision weighted combination of their prior um, and the central bank signal. If we rearrange this thing, we can get to four. And four gives us two things that are going to be important to our experiment. One is that rightmost term which is just telling us uh, what is the optimal degree to which a, an agent should weight the central bank signal, given how they perceive its forecast precision beta and what they believe to be true about their own level of forecast uncertainty alpha. We're in control of beta. We have an incentivized measure of alpha. So we always know what a rational Bayesian should do in our experiment. And then we can compare that to this middle term, which is what we use to measure forecast credibility. And all that middle term is telling us is after you form your uh, initial outlook on inflation and we show you a signal, how much are you moving your forecast of inflation toward the central bank signal? And the degree to which that is true is what we're counting as forecast credit. Okay, so we're interested in, once you've seen a signal, how much are you actually incorporating that signal into your history? Okay. Um, Right, so let me just give you sort of an overview of a part participant's experience, and then I'll tell you a little more uh, in detail about how we're collecting these measures from subjects, and then I'll get into the results. So uh, we ran this experiment online uh, using Prolific. We had several thousand participants across the different treatments that we use. Uh, we started each of these with just a short survey. Um, after that survey, we give our participants instructions. These instructions were always available to them later in the experiment, anytime they wanted to access them. After we give them instructions, we give them a comprehension quiz. Uh, if they fail this quiz too many times, we exclude them. Um, I'll just say that, yeah, so this is common. Uh, with online experiments, people will just race through these things. They're trying to just click buttons and maximize earnings. This is mostly meant to eliminate those people. I, I will tell you, I've checked. Failure rates for this are not correlated with treatment, and they're just low generally. So it, uh, arguably, this does lead to a, a selected sample, but it doesn't seem to be that much of an issue for us. OK, uh, after that, we have our subjects complete the forecasting task. Uh, this is sort of the heart of our experiment. This comprises three different decision periods. And importantly, these decision periods are going to be independent of one another. So uh, the information that they see and the decisions that they make in the first decision period have nothing to do with what they see and the decisions they make in the second or the third, so on and so forth. Um, but it's important to keep in mind that every one of our participants will make uh, three decisions or will complete three decision periods. Uh, after this, we give them a non-compulsory survey of decisions. We tell them what we're going to pay them for, and then we send them the later. Okay, so what does the decision period look like? Well, for each decision period, at the start of that period, we're going to expose our participant to 12 quarters worth of economic history. And that economic history will consist of two things. It will uh, tell the subjects what the central bank's one quarter ahead forecast of inflation was for each quarter, and then what inflation actually turned out to be. 
uh, in that same order. And so the only two pieces of information that they really have here, I'm, I mean, they can use this to sort of learn other things that they want, are what was inflation? What did the central bank forecast inflation to be? And using those two pieces of information, they can try to learn something about the central bank's ability to forecast little. Okay, using just that information, they're going to form an initial forecast of inflation here, which were uh, a point. And when they do that, they're going to give us a point forecast and a range forecast. These will both be incentivized. Uh, after that, we're going to show them what the central bank's own forecast is for the next quarter, uh, the same quarter for which they're forming their own forecast. And then we give them a chance to update. Right. And again, I want to say what we're interested in is the extent to which they incorporate the central bank's forecast into their updated point forecasts. And uh, in particular, what we want to know is how does that depend on the economic information that we show them here? So it's here where we introduce treatment variation in terms of what they see for these economic histories. Okay. Great. Um, now, let me just tell you quickly how we incentivize these things. So that topmost equation, equation five, is how we incentivize our point forecast. All that thing is saying is that uh, if your point forecast is perfectly accurate, you can earn some maximum amount of money. Uh, and then for every one percentage point uh, that your forecast is wrong, that amount of money is cut in half and we treat errors symmetrically. So if you over forecast by some magnitude, you're penalized in the exact same way as if you under forecast by some magnitude. And then six is how we incentivize the range forecast. And what this is saying is this. When you form your range forecast, if actual inflation falls within that range forecast, you can earn something. And if it falls outside of your range forecast, you earn nothing. Conditional on earning something, the larger is the range forecast, the less money you earn. And so here, they want to report a range that they think is sufficiently large that it will almost always certainly contain inflation. But conditional on that, it can't be infinitely large because then they'll earn nothing. And so we're hoping that by using this, we're getting some true representation of their actual forecast uncertainty. Okay. Is, uh, is the functional form important in terms of what their optimal learning actually is? Because this is this yeah. looks a bit different from like a typical kind of you know quadratic loss function mm -hmm. that is used to kind of like motivate. Um. It's, I, I would have to think carefully about how other functional informs might influence the data that we collect. Um, but again, I, because it's constant across treatments, it, it shouldn't matter too much, right? So it, you, could, you could imagine a world in which we, we, we didn't make certain choices here where people's incentive would just be, well, I should make my forecast range infinitely large, and then we don't really learn anything from it. And that would matter because then if their forecast uncertainty is infinitely large, it's going to always be optimal to update full. And so that would influence what we think is true of deviations from a, from a Bayesian benchmark. Um, so to that extent, things like that would matter. But small variations in this, I'm not sure how much they would matter. I think it would just depend on how the functional forms differ. But uh, I, it, it could be interesting to consider how the way that we're incentivizing data influences the data we collect and then sort of the conclusions that we draw from it. Can you remind me on options? I'm sorry, say it again. Can you remind me on options? I, I can't hear you. I'm sorry. So, so, can okay. you remind me how large the inputs are that they can put in the forecast? So they're unbounded. They're unbounded. They're unbounded. They can be as large as they want. Uh, but they're not. I mean, so in reality, they turn out not to be because if you give me an infinitely large range forecast, then you're always going to earn no money. And so that sort of the incentive structure that we create seems to impose discipline on what is true of the range forecast that we collect. And I should say, this is not new. This is, we've used this, uh, I've used this in other papers and it's pretty consistently done a good job in terms of collecting what we think is a good proxy for forecast uncertainty. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I told you the every participant is gonna see three histories. The histories that we show them is uh, sort of our treatment variation. We're interested in relating what they see in these economic histories to forecast credibility. These three histories that I'm showing you are the core three histories that we're going to use throughout our experiment. We call them early, late, and consistent, very uncreatively, 
the names are just describing to you when the bulk of forecast errors occur. So in early, most of the forecast errors occur early on in the history. Uh, in late, the exact opposite is true. And then inconsistent forecast errors are sort of just distributed consistently throughout the economic history that we show people. Um, these histories are designed around real world forecast performance from the Bank of England uh, circa around 2010. The first history that we actually form and the one that's calibrated to real world data is early. And then after we do that, we just, so I, I should say, this, we produce this data from a linearized uh, three equation Dickensian model. And I just come up with a shock sequence that allows me to very closely match features of real world data to create early. Then we just change the shocks around to create late. The point being that both the magnitude by which and the speed at which forecast performance changes in early and late is identical. And the only thing that's different between the two is whether the bank is transitioning into good forecast performance or poor forecast performance. And then uh, the historical forecast precision is identical across all three histories. And what we wanted with consistent was uh, a history where historical forecast precision was the same as in early and late, but there was no discernible pattern in forecast errors to think of it sort of a, as a baseline so that we can understand how these sorts of uh, the, the time profile of errors here and here matter relative to a world where there is no discernible time profile of errors. Uh, it's these histories that we use whenever we think of uh, how the timing of errors matters, and then we're going to use in our contextual communication treatments. And then we also, for our forecast performance treatments, are going to always use consistent because here the time profile of errors uh, is, is essentially uh, non-existent, right? We just had uh, identically distributed, or distributed forecasters throughout the history. And then the only thing that we're going to change in the other versions of consistent weather that we're going to create are the magnitude of errors throughout so that we can change the central bank's historical forecast precision while holding the other features of its forecasting history. Sorry. Unbiased, right? Inconsistent, they're unbiased. Here, if you look at just these economic histories, gamma is going to be non-zero, but uh, obviously so, right? Because you have these discernible periods of, of poor performance. Here, these are more, the gamma is essentially zero right in there. I mean, it's there, it's not non, it's not exactly zero. It's something like two to three basis points throughout. Um, I was just gonna ask, is that what they see um, the previous term? Oh. Yeah, so they're going to see some version of this. It doesn't look like this. The interface is much nicer. Uh, I should have a screenshot in here, and I'm sorry that I don't. Um, but yeah, they're going to they're going to see versions of these histories. And you're highlighting that to them, I guess. That is the we don't show them green. We should. We, oh, what we're going to show them is the forecast and inflation, right? And essentially, it's up to them to back this out, um, and then to use that to to form their own perceptions of a central bank's forecast procedure. Now, I should say they're always going to see some version of this. They don't always see this exact thing. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a second. Yeah. For the purpose of the treatment is basically one important point with all these errors. It's just your point to impart to the users that the central bank is not a hot hand or cold hand. So, in some sense, yes and no. And in a certain set of treatments, we try to learn whether or not it's whether or not the source of errors is important. That comes in our communication treatments. But for the other things, we're agnostic about the source of errors. They're free to assume whatever they want um, when looking at these histories. And it could be the case that it's completely rational for them to behave one way or another, depending upon what they believe. Our only interest is, is in how does this time profile of errors matter? Because essentially what we want to know is, should we be thinking of credibility as something endogenous? Because when you start to think of credibility as something endogenous, and you embed that into just even a simple three, three equation McKinsey model, you can get very different uh, inflation dynamics just as a function of that. Um, so, so that's what we're, what we're trying to understand here. But, but to answer your question, it, the, the source can matter. I'm sorry. Yes. Is it exactly these scenarios? Because there's more going on, right? Like you can look at the consistent scenario mm -hmm. and think that inflation in that scenario is just more volatile. Like the blue dash line mm -hmm. looks more volatile than it does in either the early or late. And so it's not just that the errors are consistent over time, mm -hmm. but that the thing being forecasted is itself harder to forecast. Um, 
Um, so it, it, yeah, so it could be the case that inflation here is more volatile. Where I would think that would matter is maybe if inflation is more volatile, it has less to do with what I think is true about the central bank's ability to forecast it. And it would probably have something more to do with the, infl the participants' ability to forecast that inflation. If that were true, what I think we would expect to see are differences in forecast uncertainty that are uh, here relative to these other things. We don't see that. Uncertainty is about equal everywhere. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm going quite slow. Let me let me speed up. So uh, now I told you in forecast performance, we're going to use five different versions of, versions of that, that consistent history. They're going to range from consistent great all the way to consistent terrible. Where the difference is this. In consistent great, the uh, central bank's historical forecast precision is 13 basis points. And that sort of degrades monotonically to our terrible version of consistent where it's 170 basis points. Here, what we want to understand is how does this matter for forecast for, uh, precision? And here in these uh, treatments where historical forecast precision is constant, what we care about is how does this matter? How does the timing of forecast errors matter? Okay, so I've said a lot. Let me try to go quickly for the results. First, I want to talk to you about what we see in forecast performance. So when we do this, each one of our subjects is going to essentially participate in one of these rows. So for each participant we have, we sort them randomly into one row. That participant will participate in each one of these three histories. For the results that I'm going to show you, we're only using data from history three. And so you get a between subject comparison of forecast credibility as we're measuring it from grade uh, all the way through two. And our interest is in how does this degradation and forecast performance when we move from here to here map into forecast credibility? Uh, and this is what we see. So the red line I'm showing you is what a rational Bayesian would do based on the economic information that we showed them. This also uh, accounts for the uncertainty that we measure because alpha is part of how a rational Bayesian should behave. And what we see is that participants do qualitatively behave in the way that we would expect them to behave if they were Bayesian, except for the fact that they systematically under reward a uh, very good forecast precision. So um, forecasting well does give you some benefit relative to forecasting very poorly, but not nearly so much benefit as would be predicted by theory, right? So you're getting this muted relationship between how well the central bank forecasts and how much people are willing to base their own expectations on that forecast. And what we kind of wanted to understand is, is why that's true. And it turns out the reason that that's true is because people just don't correctly account for their own level of forecast uncertainty when trying to decide what weight to place on a central bank signal. So what we would actually expect to see when we make this very simple scatter plot, if people were actually reacting to their own uncertainty correctly is a downward sloping line, right? So the, the larger is alpha, the higher is my own forecast precision or the smaller is my expectation about my own forecast error. And in that world, right? So for any, any given signal that I see, the more certain I am about my own prior, the less I care about the signal that I'm seeing or the less I'll rely on it. And so in that world, this estimated line here, this fitted line, it should be downward sloping. And instead it's completely flat. And this is true no matter how we partition the data. So if I do this by treatment, we get the same thing. If I put it in regressions, we get the same thing. If I add in controls from our survey, we get the same thing. So people just don't react to their own uncertainty well. Um, okay. Uh, so next, what we want to consider are, you know, what are the effects of the, of, of the timing of forecast errors? Um, it could be that we wind up in a world where people just equally weight all of the information available to them. And if, if that's true, we would have something like equation seven describing the way that people form their perceptions of beta. Or it could be that uh, the time profile of errors matters for how people weight the historical information that's available to them. So for example, you could wind up in a world where people pay attention to the more recent past if there have been sort of noticeable changes in a central bank's forecast performance. Um, for these treatments, again, a subject is gonna participate in only one row of these things. They're gonna make all three decisions, but we designed this in such a way where for each participant, we can use the, the data that we collect from all histories. And so we're using a within subject comparison here uh, for these results. This design is uh, such that we're netting out sort of learning and order effects. Okay, 
So what we would expect to see if people equally weighted uh, all of the information that was available to them across these three histories is that uh, they would update according to these red triangles. What we actually see are these blue circles, right? So what we're seeing is that um, when a central bank's forecast history used to be bad, but they sort of transitioned into good performance, which is what we see here in early, uh, people are actually sort of almost overweighting the signal to, to some small degree. Um, when the when the time profile of errors is consistent and there is no discernible pattern uh, uh, in, in their forecast errors, people behave uh, exactly in the way that theory predicts that they will. When there's been a recent change in forecast performance for the worse, people severely underweight uh, these, these uh, signals relative to what they would do if they equally weighted all information that's available to them. And the magnitude by which these deviations uh, sorry, by this deviation compares to this is about fivefold. So they're they're deviating from this Bayesian sort of equal weighting baseline by about five more times than they are uh, here, um, which is interesting. And so what we wanted to understand is clearly there's some sort of recency bias that's being induced by the time profile of forecast errors. To what extent is that true? And so we estimate sort of equation seven here using numerical methods. What we're estimating is lambda. The larger is lambda, the more recency bias there is. And what we see is this. So we see that uh, lambda for our late histories is about 6.2. For our early histories is 2.45. These are highly significantly different. And what this is telling us is that recency bias is about three times as strong in late than in early. And so what we take out of that is this. We, we draw this out a little bit more in the paper, uh, but hopefully that is what I've said is enough to convince you of this. Um, Forecast credibility erodes much more quickly than it builds. And the takeaway from this is that even if a central bank has been doing very well as a forecasting institution, if there's some exogenous shock that leads to the sort of discrete change in forecast performance that we see in these histories, and I should say the economic history that we're showing them that we're calling late isn't crazy. That's about what things look like as, as these banks transitioned into uh, the Great Recession. Um, these banks cannot rest on their laurels they can very, very quickly lose their ability to influence expectations with their forecasts. Um, and so maybe what we need is a stronger, quicker response. So maybe people need to behave like emerging market central banks instead of like the Fed of the um, Okay, I, I know I'm almost out of time. I wanna quickly tell you about the communication experiment. So for this, set of, for this set of treatments, where we try to study the role of contextualizing communication, we're doing the exact same thing. The only difference is now, after each one of our subjects has seen early and consistent, we show them late. And when we show them this late history where the bank is forecasted very poorly and where we now know that their forecast credibility is going to be low, whenever we show them the central bank's numerical forecast, we show them a written statement alongside it. Uh, and the written statement that they could see would be one of these six things. So we have a control statement that just describes what a central bank ought to do. We layer in sort of an outlook that reinforces the numerical forecast. And then we tell them that the source of the bank's poor forecasting performance is either the result of some exogenous shock, some endogenous policy error. And then we tell them what is true about their relative uh, performance uh, relative to peer forecasting institutions. Um, and I should say we, you know, we control for the complexity of these things so that you know, hopefully they're comparable. And the only thing that's changing is the information content. Uh, and this is what we see. Um, I, let me just say quickly again, these blue dots are their updates. I have normalized this so that the way that you should interpret these estimates are, what is the credibility gain relative to our control treatment? Uh, again, the red triangles are what a uh, rational Bayesian ought to do. And what we see is that when we provide contextualizing communication in all treatments, there is a, there is a credibility gain. So learning something about the source of the, so the shock, whether it's exogenous or endogenous, leads to boosting credibility. Um, and something as simple as just reinforcing your numerical outlook with a written statement also leads to an increase in forecast credibility. What's interesting is there doesn't seem to be a big difference in whether shocks or forecasting errors were caused by exogenous shock or endogenous errors. I think what matters to people is just that the bank is saying they recognize something was wrong because whether it was exogenous or endogenous, if they can say that they've seen it, they can react to it. Um, 
there's also it also doesn't seem to matter what is true about their forecasting performance relative to peer institutions, um, which is good because people aren't respect or are, are not responding strongly to just sort of statements that aren't conveying any information, really. Okay. So uh, what do we what do we learn from this? Well, we see that forecasting performance matters, but not nearly as sharply as this theory would predict. And credibility is endogenous, and, and the dynamics of this endogenous credibility seem to be asymmetric. Uh, there's very strong recency bias, and an outcome of that is that it can take much longer to build credibility when you lose it than, uh, than to, to lose it after you've already built it, right? And so the policy implication is maybe central banks should react very quickly to these sorts of scenarios, because it's probably going to be true that the cost of defending credibility is much lower than the cost of rebuilding it once you've lost it. Uh, and also what we see is that sort of the contextual communications that we see central banks publish that are common in like NPRs and IRs uh, are a valuable way of rationalizing past forecasting performance, but also reinforcing a central bank's outlook. Uh, and that's it. Thank you. We'll take a few questions from the row and questions. In terms of credibility, who do you think this represents? You know, so these are people who take the, your 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 subjects who actually take the survey. You're don't know much about the real world, I, I guess, by and large, based on their results, maybe the surveys or whatever. But um, you know. I think most normal people who aren't interested in these things, they don't sit down and look at a set of outcomes and forecasts and theory. People who do that are financial market participants who have like a much wider understanding of, of the situation. Mm -hmm. So and we know that like if you just survey regular members of the public and say what do you think inflation was there, completely off the charts are off. Sure. So some 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 yeah. Well, like I mean, a lot of a lot of like in the survey data, a lot of forecasts do look reasonable. And then you also have people who say crazy things like. I think inflation is going to be ten times higher than it's been ever in my lifetime. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I, I, that, I, I take that. Um, so, in some sense, what we wanted to do was to learn something about how the average person would make use of information if you could, if you could get them to pay attention to it. Right? Central banks want to communicate with households, uh, but we all know that it's very hard to command their attention. And, and right now, probably central banks are failing at doing that, whether they want to communicate with households or not. Um, so here we sort of bypassed development attention. And what we're studying is if conditional on getting you to pay attention to this information, how effective can this be? And what can we learn about how this information relates to forecast credibility? Um, this problem, so also I, one thing I, I would like to do is, is take the data that we have and compare that to what we see in surveys. So there's this really nice paper from Camille Cornand and, and Paul Hubert who came out in the European Economic Review recently, and they do something like that. So they, they actually have a, a, a two paper series where they compare expectations from lab experiments to surveys to professional forecasters, so on and so forth. And in many ways, the expectations data that you get from learning to forecast experiments, though I should say this is different than typical learning to forecast experiments in important ways, uh, looks like what households do, except for the frequency with which they update, which is what uh, Cornon and Hubert show in their most recent paper. We took some effort to design this in such a way to deal with that problem. Whether or not we successfully did that, I actually don't know because I haven't looked at it yet, and I shouldn't. Um, the last thing I would say on that is one we also have in the paper an empirical exercise where we look at whether or not we can see the same sort of behavior in real world markets. And maybe this goes to what you're saying, right? Maybe what we've done is we've just turned people into market participants in an experiment, but we we are able to find evidence of this sort of recency bias and how people use information as a function of a central bank's forecasting performance in the recent past uh, in, in markets. Um, but I, I think we can do more to try to pin down what we're showing you. Are we showing you something about how households would respond to information or are we showing you something about how market participants probably respond to that region. You could maybe you could you could end up showing something like central banks don't actually want to communicate so well with public if they don't update well or if they if you can lose credibility as a I'm sorry, say that again. Do you think you could come to a situation or you could I I don't think you can draw the conclusion, but like 
is it is it possible that like uh, the assumption is the second part want to communicate this and then you find you know like, you can lose credibility and it could be a problem and it's possible that like honestly you want to communicate this well, I mean, central banks do do this. They 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 want to communicate their forecasts because they have some interest in using those forecasts to guide expectations. But once they've done that, this you know what what it is that they said would be true and what turned out to be true are just part of the historical record. And people can use that information to do essentially what we're having participants do here. So not doing that would be not communicating that would be akin to just not communicating, which I I don't think. We would say well. it's interesting exactly in that uh, respect as well that uh -huh. that uh, central banks definitely net gamers of any communication right mm -hmm. so so it reinforces uh, the, the, the view that that communication is, is actually an additional tool of central bank policy as opposed to just uh, putting out the forecast so i think that's it's a very interesting paper but that's an additional thing that you have to communicate almost independent of whether it's your mistake or 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 you to external factors. It's a very interesting plan. So communicated focus is one thing, but you also communicated focus errors, which is completely different matter, matter continuing this the theme of mm -hmm. you know you know what is this about so it looks like it, it's it's about upper bound on how much communication can possibly achieve because you're giving them all the information that they need to be Bayesian mm -hmm. and they just for whatever reason just not capable they look at a pathway so that's and that's already an upper bound right so that, that's interesting because that's, that's yeah. a different angle um, but uh, the cleaner way of sort of another treatment that would be useful is to do exactly the same but not tell them what the error was let them sort of discern for what they've seen and then based on that uh, so that is what they're that's what happens, yeah. that, you're not telling them the i thought you said you're showing them both sorry no yeah, in the histories you. that i showed you yeah, i added the error to make it more salient for you to make it easier for you to understand what the error looked like our participants when they see the histories they see inflation and they see the it's up to them to back out the information um even that that's not how it's presented right this is like uh in, in the real world they would have to kind of remember what the history a forecast was or somehow put all the data together then it's never like in a published simple thing 